You all ready, Herb? Yeah. Okay, call the meeting to order then. Uh, roll call, I see all board members are present. And just need a motion to approve the agenda first. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? And next is public comments. We have several people here, I believe, who are signing up. And you will direct them in. Hi, guys. Hi. We just ask that you state your name and how, what your relationship to the school district is. Um, I'm AC Rogan. I'm a sophomore at the Monarchy High School. And yeah, that's pretty much my relationship. Pretty much, um, when I was told about this opportunity, I knew that I needed to share my perspective about online learning and the disadvantages to staying online for the rest of the school year. In the beginning, I was having trouble putting into words exactly what I wanted to say because I had so much on my mind. Um, so I put on my Snapchat story, which is a form of social media I used to connect with my friends and ask them to give their input and how they felt about online learning. And I was immediately flooded with friends and peers telling me how online learning was negatively affecting them. This research that, I, research that I compiled from my peers made it clear that online learning doesn't work for them. Many kids brought up the fact that they have zero motivation to do anything and feel more and more lonely as the months pass. This brings up the idea of the importance of not only the physical health of the students, but the importance of the mental health of the students. There are hardly any teens that lives are in danger because of COVID. But by moving school online and isolating us from the social interactions throughout the day is putting our lives in danger due to mental health issues. Suicide rates have and teens are increase, increasing drastically. If elementary kids are obedient enough to follow the COVID guidelines and attend school, us older and more mature high schoolers could handle it adequately, as well to a higher standard than eight, eight year olds. Also, teens of all grades are still meeting up outside of school anyways, so staying at home isn't really doing us good except for the fact that we are not receiving the education we need to help us in the future. Another problem with online learning is people's grades are plummeting and the skill people are learning are often forgotten the next week. If you ask me what I learned in the first two weeks of school, I would not be able to tell you. And I normally consider myself a very good student who can keep up with the work that they give us. And I know I'm not the only one that this is happening to. No kid has the discipline to sit through a meeting when it's so easy to just turn off your camera and zone out. As for the teachers, one of mine has said, and I quote, as a teacher, I don't know if kids are paying attention or not because they don't have their camera on. We cannot make students turn them on. And students have also expressed a lack of motivation for learning online. This shows that even teachers are having trouble connecting with the students, and I can only imagine how much work they put into the lessons that are forgotten the next week. It's not the teacher's fault, it's just the online atmosphere and lack of structure that is the problem. Lastly, my house is very chaotic with siblings of all ages, and the learning atmosphere just doesn't work in my house. And I feel I'm struggling more than I would if I was in person. I've had so many people say the same thing. I understand we need to take precautions, but the fact of the matter is that Corona is here to stay and we can't stop our lives forever when other places are taking the necessary steps to moving on. Going back to school is a good step in the right direction, and I really hope you guys take into consideration all aspects of online learning and how it's affecting one of the students as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just ask that you state your name and how your relationship to the school district. Yes. Uh, my name is Jack Jolter. I'm a 17th grade in my house, and I'm going to be a junior at Pontiac High School. I'm a vice president of the class of 2022, and involved in football, basketball, FCA, FBLA, and a member of the National Honor Society. My family moved to Wanakee in 2009, the summer before I started kindergarten. I'm here tonight to encourage you to vote to reopen our schools for in-person in instruction. I value school and take a great pride in my schoolwork and extracurricular activities. I find that I learn the most from interactions with my classmates and teachers. I, I thrive on structure and boundaries set forth by the school. I'm doing my best to be successful at learning virtually, but I feel disconnected from my classmates and teachers. Our virtual model lacks this energy. It is difficult to stay focused and, ener and energized while sitting in front of the screen all day by yourself. I believe that in-person instruction is the most beneficial form of education for me and my classmates. We want to go to school and know that in-person school is going to look differently this year. We accept this and are going to appreciate and are appreciative of all the measures taken by the administration and staff 
to allow us to go back to school safely. Although we are older, we continue to need guidance, structure, and boundaries in order to grow and be successful. We need, we need the in-person interaction with our peers and teachers. I'm thankful for the active and involved coaches and leaders who have kept students and athletes engaged over the last few months via Zoom calls, socially distant contact days, etc. These interactions are meaningful as they allow students and athletes to maintain structure and have something to look forward to. I hope that our school, our school leaders can find ways to maximize these interactions with students. For example, these activities would include socially distant FBLA, FCA, and class officer meetings, shoot rounds in the gym, band practices, etc. We need these activities to keep us engaged, organized, motivated, and mentally healthy. I'm proud to be a Wanaki warrior because we are leaders, we are innovative, we are resilient, and we have the ability to fight on no matter what comes our way. I urge you to reopen our schools for in-person instruction. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just ask that you say your name and your relationship to the school district. All right. Good evening. My name is Harry Taylor. I'm a junior at Wanaki High School. While I'm here to express my sincere beliefs that students should be back in the classroom, I want to start by thanking my advanced health teacher, Ms. Schaefer, for the positive impact she has had on us this fall. She has been spending a lot of her class time with us live, teaching us and telling us what we're taking notes on. She schedules one-on-one -on -one time with us and uses that time to connect with us, talk to us about our mental health, life outside of school, and any areas in life that we may need help in. It is much more intimidating to schedule this time with teachers over a Zoom call, which she has managed this aspect very well. She also recaps this live everything that we should study in our own time to give us the best preparations for our tests. But not all subjects or teachers are able to be as effective online as Ms. Shaper, which has had a resulting impact on our learning. As such, I'd like to be back in the classroom as it looks to the learning method interactive live instruction and dynamic class participation. I don't learn well from online classes, lots of screen time and videos, and have myself much more productive in the classroom. I'm very concerned about being ready for my senior year as well as college. I do pray for my classmates. We all look different and we can help. We can wipe on our own desks, we can take a back lunch and be a the building if we need to. Anything to extend our classroom can Please accelerate the timeline to get me and my classmates back in our school classrooms. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. We just ask that you state your name and your relationship to the school district first. Thank you. Hi. My name is Maggie Taylor. We should go back to school because I feel online school is more stressful, complicated, and confusing than in person school. I have talked to peers and they feel the same way I do. During school, I found myself getting distracted or not understanding the lesson. And it's awkward or scary to do a simple thing like raising your hand or asking a question. Online schooling has caused me to lose track of what's due or miss instructions because of internet connection. I feel that we can take the responsibility of cleaning and sanitizing supplies with wipes and wearing masks. If we were to travel or go to public places, we would wear a mask for social distance. So if we, so we are allowed to do that, then, then school should be allowed, then we should be allowed in school. Thank you. Good evening, my name is 
Harris Brown. Um, I'm a junior at Monkey High School, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I appreciate all the work the teachers have done to create a virtual learning environment. I'm glad I'm working for some students, but it's not working for everyone. I'm here tonight to ask the Board of Education and Administration to do everything in their power to expedite the plan for high school students who want to return to classroom to do so. The isolation of learning in a virtual setting has been very difficult for me and a bunch of other students. Live teaching in a classroom provides interactive learning, which is how I found that I best learn. I learned so much from my classmates' questions and my teachers' responses. It is intimidating and stressful to ask questions in a virtual classroom so people don't ask, and then we lose sharing and learning. It has been very hard to have shorter classes along the topic in person. I miss scheduled contact time in person, and there is so much screen time per class, and then to have more screen time for homework is just so much to do. I know it'll look different, everyone does, but everything is going to be different. I just want an opportunity to have the best of the better for me and love teaching in my high school classroom. In my high school, it's best for me and all of our students. Thank you again. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lexis Sabola, and I'm a junior this year. Um, I don't know what to say, probably just out of five thousand times, but I feel like it needs to be said. I want to go back to school. I talked to a bunch of my friends and some who couldn't be here tonight. We're all more stressed about online school than we are when we're in person. It could just be doing here, it was a hard year, but this is literally killing me. One thing that's nice is that you seem to stay. I don't know if we'd still have it if we'd go back to school, but I decided it as a day to relax and focus on myself. But I find myself doing homework all day, even when I'm caught up. Looking back at the past one days, I'm pretty sure I only had one or two days that I didn't do homework, and I just had a self day. Many of the teachers tell us to make sure we're studying, staying mentally healthy throughout these hard times, but then proceed to give us 20 things to do. And I personally think that teachers have given us more homework during online school. I'm not sure if it's because they think we have time to do it, or we just don't have enough time in class to get to it, which brings me to my next point. We only get 45 minutes of class. I'm in three AP classes, one of them being AP Bio, which might be the hardest class I have. Some of the smartest people I know struggle with the class. We have 45 minutes to learn anything, and the rest we have to learn on our own. Um, I'm not saying that we should learn from the Zoom classes. I'm saying that there's more we can accomplish in person. Only time I have to get away from school is soccer. I used to think of soccer as a fun activity, but now I find myself using it as an out of doing homework. There are times that I don't want to go home after soccer because that means I have to go back to doing homework. Although after this, I'm going to high school soccer for a second contact day. And I'm very grateful that you allowed us to have this time. Not only do I get to play, but I also get to catch up with my friends that I don't really get to see. Our junior and senior year are the most important years of our lives as we prepare for college. And it's hard to do that online. I appreciate the effort that you put in to try and get us back into school, but I feel like it needs to happen quicker. Thank you. I get to see by missing a wide range of people. 
Even though it won't be the same, going back to school in person is something I know I look forward to. I hope we're able to go back in person sooner rather than later. Thank you. and I'm in the 8th grader at the middle school. I'm trying my best to make the most out of online school. I know my teachers are working really hard to make virtual learning the best it can be. The way I learn is by being with other people or just seeing someone in person. I am more energized and feel more focused around other people. Whereas on a Zoom, no, nobody participates like they would in class and a lot, of, a lot of people have their cameras turned off. I participated in the middle school volleyball practices this fall and even though it was different than usual, I still look forward to that one hour two times a week. Like volleyball, I know in-person school will be different than we are used to, but I look forward to that day and actually being able to see people and learn from them. Please consider reopening our school soon. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Noah Jaco, and I would very much like if we could go back to school as soon as possible. Um, I very much dislike online school. It is much harder to learn online, especially in classes like math and sciences, where much of the things we do in class are activities and labs, which are much harder without the teacher there to ask questions, and it's much just harder just to communicate with your group. Um, also, every day I get headaches from having to stare at the Chromebooks, Chromebook screen all day, and those are a pain, and I wish I didn't have those. Um, and I also miss just seeing people in the commons every day and getting to say hi to my friends. And I just miss having to, getting to see the human interaction, and it's boring just having to sit at home all day. Um, I also hope high school sports can return as soon as possible. Um, I very much miss having practices and games daily. And I think it is very important for people because some people's only incentive for school is sports at the end of the day. And I think it's very important that we can get back to those as soon as possible. Thank you.
Dennis Lee. I live on 1212 Dartmouth Drive. We are Wanakee. We are known for our outstanding schools. The Wanakee School District is the envy of nearly every other district in the state. We didn't achieve this status by accident. It's taken a relentless determination and a drive for excellence from the teachers, support staff, administrators, parents, students, the community as a whole, and the school board. We've refused to accept the status quo. We've refused to let obstacles stand in our way. We're leaders. We are the epitome as to what a great school district looks like. And now, the coronavirus is presenting us with a new challenge, a new choice, and a new opportunity to lead. We can be like every other district in the area and the county and stay in a virtual format for who knows how long. Or we can rise through the challenge, choose to overcome the challenges in front of us, and show others how we can continue to lead by getting our kids back in school where they belong. We've learned a lot since March, and I won't go through all the numbers, but two of the most important takeaways are that one, in controlled environments where all the safety protocol calls can be put in place, like in hospitals or in schools that are open, the transmission rate is negligible. And two, of course, is that the virus is not a threat to school children and other young and healthy people. We know who the most vulnerable are and can protect them. I don't have enough time to go through all the logistics as to how it can be done, but there are many models out there from other schools and other places that have, and we can too. Look, 99% of the students and staff aren't going to have any significant health problems as a result of the virus. But it seems as if we are solving for the 1% who could be vulnerable by shutting everything down for everyone. That doesn't make any sense. Instead, we should be solving for the 99% who need to be in school and come up with a way to accommodate the other 1% as well. Nothing is ever going to be 100% risk-free. Children are at risk every time they get on a bus or in their parents' car. But at some point, we have to accept these risks in life because the stakes are too high if we don't. The bottom of the line is that we need to figure out what we can do, not what we can't, because zero is not the answer. In closing, when I was in high school, one of my favorite teachers would have a new quote on the chalkboard every morning. The only one I remember, and the one that had the greatest impact on how I try to live my life, was those who want to do something find a way. Those who don't find excuses. So let's find a way, because after all, we are Wanakee. Thank you. My name is Molly Miller and I live at 1504 Blue Ridge Trail. I struggle to write this for weeks as I feel this is a steep uphill battle. I am discouraged by the decisions that our state 
our county and our school district have made for our children. I think we're in big trouble, but our kids are going to suffer the worst outcomes. My husband and I are both essential workers working away from our home. I went back to work in healthcare after spring break in March, afraid of the coronavirus, mostly afraid of the unknown, but nevertheless went back to my job without a choice. At the time, I fully expected to contract COVID at work from a patient or a colleague or touching a door handle or at home handling my groceries. I didn't, I wore a mask, I washed my hands, we learned, we pivoted, we conformed. We have three children in the district, and like many others, we have raised our kids to work hard, never give up, never make excuses. This is their life, but we are guiding them into their future, so here I am tonight. In our family, we also do what science says, we get vaccines, we wear seatbelts and helmets, we don't have smartphones or social media until high school, and now we wear our masks. There are hundreds of reasons why my children need to be in school, but in the interest of time, I'll share a few. My 10-year-old, simply because she's 10. She's not old enough to sit at a desk by herself and keep herself on task and engaged while we go to work. She's hanging in there by a thread. I call home three times a day, making sure she's paying attention to the clock, that she doesn't get sidetracked playing during her break, that she's nourishing and hydrating her body, and she gets online for her standardized testing or her BAS test or her reading group Tuesday and Thursday. If we're really desperate, my elderly mother makes the trip down to oversee her day. Like many, many others in Dane County, we are doing our best, but is it enough for her? My 13-year-old is an eighth grader who's a good student who is on most of his effective learning by doing, playing, building, breaking, rebuilding, discovering, inventing, digging, experimenting, tinkering, trying, since he was scaling our staircase without hanging on at 15 months old. In a school setting, he learns best by asking questions, making mistakes, collaborating, teamwork, and learning from others' questions questions that he may be too nervous to ask aloud. He's quiet, but the activity and simple buzz of his friends, teachers, and classmates around him gives him energy. He is lonely. Are we doing enough for him? My 16-year-old is a junior in debatably the most challenging year of her education. She's taking six college prep AP compacted or high-level courses. She has worked for every grade she has ever earned, studying, reviewing, reading, putting in the time, studying more. A to Z, front to back, cover to cover, for full understanding. I wouldn't have thought for one second that she would struggle with online learning. And then a few weeks ago, after long after the technical issues were resolved and things were going more smoothly, she broke down one night and told me that she hates school. Hates. It's just too much. She can't do it. She can't teach herself the missing gaps in material, the missing chapters, the missing concepts, missing labs, missing time. Of course she can. She always does, and she will. But are we doing enough for her? I need a choice for my children now. Thanks for your time. Hello, um, my name is Chris Butel. I live in Monarchy, and we have an eighth grade daughter at uh, Monarchy Middle School. Um, so, my husband and I um, are, are representing. Um, our thoughts tonight because we believe the school district needs to re-examine their approach to the 2021 school year and adapt. Since initial play plans were laid out in August, we've learned three key lessons. One, in-person instruction is not causing increases in COVID cases. An October 21 article from NPR states, despite concerns, two new international studies show no consistent relationship between in-person K-12 schooling and the spread of the coronavirus. Additionally, an October 22nd New York Times article stated from a pediatrician and infectious disease expert that there's a pretty good base of evidence that schools can open safely in the presence of strong safety plans and even at higher levels of case incidents than we have suspected. Number two, remote learning is hurting our kids academically and mentally. Remote learning, including hybrid, scales back curriculum and severely limits teacher-led instruction. Today, as an example, today our eighth graders receive two 35-minute sessions per week of teacher-led instruction in their core classes of science, social studies, com arts, and math, compared to the in-person model of five 45-minute sessions. So while our students have been in school for six and a half weeks, they've only received the equivalent of about two weeks of instruction. And in regards to mental health, as of mid-September, Dane County has recorded 15 suicides of people 24 or younger, compared with eight for all of 2019. And in a recent Wisconsin Journal article, Dr. Katie Schmidt at the Unity Point Child Psychiatric Hospital said there were nights where it could have admitted 10 kids a night. And she points to isolation and lack of success in a virtual schooling environment as significant stressors for all kids. 
And thirdly, we've got top-ranked districts in the state, including Conwag, Arrowhead, and Cedarburg, who have successfully returned to school full-time in person. There have certainly been challenges, but they have improved their processes, quarantined staff and students as necessary, and persevered. The virus is not going away, and some scientists are forecasting that this could continue in the spring of 2022. We are concerned that Wanakee has not identified a process or a target date for bringing schools back, bringing kids back to school full time. And, in, and to that end, we ask that the school board take the following steps. Resume conversations about a reopening plan tonight and call for an, emergency, an additional school board meeting as needed. Do not wait until November 9th to take action. Focus all efforts on resuming full-time in-person instruction for all grades with a target date of September, December 1st and a continued 100% remote option. Immediately survey parents to determine the number of students that would be in school so we can make plans built with current numbers. Develop a parent task force for each building. Parents want to help. Leverage our time and perspective to help manage the reopening. Empower the building level administration to create a plan focused on achieving full-time in-person instruction that implements six-foot distancing to the greatest extent possible, but not as a requirement. My husband and I are not alone in this perspective, as we're part of a 195-member parent group that is focused on getting our kids back in school. And we know that there are many in our community that feel very differently, but their needs will continue to be met by offering a fully remote option. The bottom line is our kids are hurting and falling behind. They need to get back in the classroom, and our mindset needs to be, how do we quickly make that happen? Other highly ranked districts have done this. Excuse successfully. me, ma'am. We do have a three minute time limit. Yep, I'm sorry. Other, my last point is just other school districts have done this successfully, and I think Wanaki can and should be one of them. Thank you. Jeff and I have three kids. One graduated last year. We also have an eighth grader and a junior. We have lived in Wanakee for over 10 years and are active members of the community. We love Wanakee and the education that has been provided to our children. I have had conversations with most of you regarding reopening our schools. Thank you for your time and willingness to collaborate with community members. I'm encouraged by the most recent statement from Dane County Public Health that they are not seeing strong connections between in-person school environments and increased community spread and increased hospitalization. Likewise, I'm encouraged by articles from NPR and the New York Times, which indicate studies are finding that children in school are not causing surges or widespread transmission. Also encouraging, Sauk County Public Health officials and school administrators have found that COVID-19 isn't spreading in their schools, despite a surge in community cases and a difficulty in contact tracing. They are keeping their schools open for in-person instruction. Our district has worked diligently and has invested considerable time and money to provide a safe environment for our kids for in-person education. Funds for HVAC system, contact tracers, additional nurses, PPE, etc. As a community and a public school district, it is our obligation to maximize the opportunities for learning in a controlled environment. While I respect the advice of the Medical Advisory Committee to reopen our schools gradually, based on the gradual approach, our older kids will not be in school until at least the middle of February. Please consider expediting this timeline. The following are suggestion, suggested steps for implementing the plan to expedite this timeline. In order to solidify plans and to start planning now, we need to know how many students will choose to come back to in-person school. It is necessary that we survey families now this information is critical to expediting our in-person plan, and for that matter, it is essential for any plan. Please consider reopening the high school and the middle school at the same time. In an effort to collaborate and problem solve the sub shortage, a group of concerned parents have put together a list of volunteers willing to become certified and will sub once their children are in school. Additionally, please consider allowing teachers who may be quarantined or at home with minimal symptoms to teach from home via a live stream, while at the same time a paraprofessional is in, the per in person managing the classroom. Additionally, I'll say this again, it is our obligation to work together to maximize every opportunity for in-person connection and interaction 
via our enhanced learning model and co-curricular activities. Please publish a schedule consisting of all opportunities for this type of connection and interaction. I know our leaders and staff are working harder than ever to ensure our students have the best learning opportunities, and I am grateful for their efforts. In conclusion, we are aware that this topic is not on tonight's agenda, but at the same time, we cannot wait until November 9th to discuss this. We hope that you can find a way to discuss and confirm a plan to reopen our schools before the November 9th meeting. Be innovative and flexible and do what is right for our children. Thank you for your time. Holiday program. 
These are experiences our children have been a part of and are craving right now. These are the ingredients of a full school experience. Our son has been safely going to in-person about 10 out of the typical 35 hours of school per week since the beginning of the school, school year. Give all of it to him. Next, intermediate school. We have a sixth grader enrolled. This school is the beautiful building our community built together. We're really proud of it. It was built for growth. It was, I believe, like built for like a 850 and there's about 600. Um, it's not currently to full capacity. Its doors are closed to our children. Middle school, we have a seventh grader enrolled. This is the age that things start getting more serious. Students must now navigate their own schedule, transferring rooms to their other teen teachers. This can be very daunting for a seventh grader. I wish I could impress upon you the miss that is happening by not getting experience doing this and practicing these routines, preparing for high school. Our child is wrapped up in figuring out logins, breakout rooms, further bogging down his learning. If you're a typical kid that might lose focus with a screen talking to you day after day, you can understand how missing concepts and deadlines is happening. The teachers are doing their best. The model is not sustainable. It's confusing and it's not efficient. I'm telling you, I have one kid saying, Mom, get out of the room. You can't bring laundry in here. Um, I'm in a Google Meet. Mom, my microphone's on. I have a test. I'm trying to make lunch for my children. Your schools are set up for this to rock it, and you're not using them. It just, ugh. okay. High school. We have a freshman enrolled. High school and all that is done and all that it is is one of the best times of your life. We've all experienced it. Not a computer. Let the older kids go back in person. Why are we waiting? Open up the schools with the same urgency we're willing to close their doors. I wholeheartedly believe fully opening is the only way this can be done. It is the absolute right thing to do for our students, our teachers, and community. Any other way is not sustainable, and it is not school. I understand Dane County shares guidelines. We have a three-minute time limit. Can you just let me wrap it up? Please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Dane County shares guidelines also. Oh, I'm sorry. Now you got me mixed up here. I understand Dane County shares guidelines, but it also says K through 12 can open fully for in-person education and to apply guidelines to the extent possible. I think you guys are just so wrapped up in like, you've got to follow every little thing. The parents want back in school. Let's figure this out with some common sense. Also, I quote them. Ma'am, ma it's I really right have two it's, sentences, please. There are other comments we do have to read into the record from okay. other parents. I, I, I'd like to finish. I really would appreciate. And not to mention, um, I think I've met Mike um, online virtually, and he has encouraged us to come here. And the entire time, he's not even paying attention. So I find that quite disrespectful. I'm just saying no. Oh, you are. Yeah. You can give eye contact. Go ahead and let the person go back. Also, I quote them, while we're currently seeing concerning data trends in Dane County and throughout the state. Ma'am, I'm sorry. We have to let other parents have their time to make comments also. And we do have a board agenda to do. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Please open the school. I think we can do this together. If parents are willing to help, just open the doors. End of in-person. End of in-person, okay. Um, we have several, a uh, few email comments also. Um, the first is from Amy Ament. Wanakee Community School board members, I am speaking as a parent and as a healthcare professional. I have a son in 10th grade, a daughter in 7th, and a daughter in 5th grade. I currently work for a large healthcare organization with the majority of my career in inpatient hospital care. I have been an RN in the state of Wisconsin since 2005. 
my opinion is that of my own. It does not represent the opinions of the organization that I work for. I'm extremely concerned, as you should be, regarding the social isolation that closing the schools have subjected our children to in the Wanakee Community School District. Grades 5 through 12 need to be allowed to join, at a minimum, a hybrid model no later than December 1st. In my opinion, this date is not soon enough. Parents should have a choice to send their child to school and determine what is best for their children. Are you willing to let our children pay the cost of human loneliness and isolation? We cannot turn a blind eye to our children's emotional and psychological needs. The key to human health and survival is to be socially connected in meaningful ways, both physically and emotionally. The research evidence is clear and well documented regarding the psychological effects of social isolation. Subjects studied include astronauts, incarcerated individuals, immune-compromised children, researchers in isolated parts of the world, injured athletes, and elderly experiencing isolation. Humans are social beings. Our brains are not wired to handle social interaction via a Zoom meeting or FaceTime call. In fact, it is also well studied that technological interaction screen time should be limited, especially in children. Adverse effects of social isolation include depression, anxiety, lethargy, changes in sleep patterns, immunity, hormones, and alterations to metabolism. A research study published in February recently reviewed 24 previous studies on the psychological effects of quarantines during disease outbreaks, and they included negative effects such as post-traumatic stress symptoms, confusion, fear, anger, and substance misuse. Anyone who is marginalized, such as low-income families, caregivers with lack of resources and or instability in the home are at an increased risk of these effects. Parents have been forced into economic stress due to lack of child care and or resources in the home. Some parents are forced to stay home, leading to a decrease in income for the family. This further places a child at risk for the adverse effects listed above. Significant emotional changes, including isolation during coronavirus and inability to attend in-person school, lead to a decrease in the ability to cope with stress. This in turn leads to a higher risk of developing depression, anxiety, and all of the adverse effects listed above. Emotions that may be induced in children and teens include anger, frustration, sadness, hopelessness, irritation, and the inability to cope. Most concerning is the fact that mental health professionals have come forward forewarning that continued isolation will lead to a serious mental health crisis, increasing suicide rates. In 2018, the National Institute of Mental Health reported that suicide is a leading cause of death in the United States, in the second leading cause of death in individual age 10 to 34. This is very concerning. We should be concerned as parents, as caregivers, as school board members, as school district staff, and as a community. Um, due to time, I'm going to skip to her final paragraph. We need to focus on educating children, students, parents, and educators on how to stay safe during a pandemic, yet continue to live our lives with some sense of normalcy. We need to look at our neighboring school districts and take notes on their success, implementing health screening processes, teaching good hygiene, partnering with healthcare for rapid testing, and changing the way we utilize space will make in-person school a realistic and viable option that must be considered. The alternative is to continue virtual school and place our children at risk of the psychological harm that we will now see and in the future. Thank you for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Amy Ament. From Connor Huey, I am a junior at Wanakee Community High School and online school has been a struggle to say the least. Every student and teacher I've talked to has said they absolutely hate it and want school to be back in person. I miss everything about normal school, from seeing my teachers and classmates to eating lunch and talking with my friends every day. But most of all, I miss the sports. I only have two years left in my life to play sports, and I'm getting multiple seasons stripped away from me while most of the entire country at every level are finding ways to play. I hope we can find ways to solve this problem instead of just avoiding it. Sincerely, Connor Huey. From Ian Huey. Dear Board of Education, I am an 8th grader at Wanakee High School. I have been in Wanakee my whole life. Here are some reasons why I think we should go back to school. Reason 1 is because I learn a lot better when I can raise my hand in class and interact with the teacher and others around me. Reason 2 is that as an 8th grader, it makes me a little nervous looking ahead to next year in high school. I feel that with virtual learning, I might not be quite prepared for being a freshman. The final reason is that for some classes, it is very hard to do that online. For example, science is difficult because you have to do a lot of hands-on activities. So when you're virtual, you have to do them at home 
and the process of the activity can get very confusing and sometimes trying to get a hold of teachers to ask a question can also be difficult. So all in all, I believe that we should go back because I can learn and understand the concepts we are learning a lot better. It will help me get ready and more prepared for a high school next year. It also helps a lot with hands-on activities we do in and out of class. And finally, I think we can figure it out because a lot of other towns make it work, so I think we can do it. Thank you for listening. Sincerely, Ian Hugh. Next is Aaron Jost, uh, grade 11. Hello, Wanakee High School. My name is Aaron Jost and I'm a junior this year at Wanakee High School. This year's online format has been very hard adjustment for me as well as many of my peers. As we approach the second quarter, I am disappointed to not be returning to a hybrid model like the one that was supposed to go into at the end of the first quarter. To begin, I would like to say that all of my teachers have been doing a great job throughout virtual school and are doing their best to ensure we can get some learning done and I'm very appreciative that, of that. I am also appreciative of the hard work you have all done on the school board during this unprecedented time. However, learning school through a screen is something that I struggle with because it creates a lack of motivation that makes it harder for me to learn and complete tasks such as homework and studying for my tests. Being glued to a screen five days a week is extremely bad for both physical and mental health and the increased workload as well as lower social interaction has made this year much more stressful than it needs to be. The current plan of returning to a hybrid model on February 15th is overly conservative in my opinion. Not returning to a hybrid model until almost four months from now is going to continue to pile stress onto my peers and I, and will continue, will contribute to even less social interactions throughout this fall and winter. If we are able to go hybrid in December, however, it would greatly benefit my classmates and I and give us a proper educational and social experience. I would finally be able to see school friends that I have not seen much of in the last seven months. Not only that, I would also finally be able to escape staring at a screen for the entire day and my motivation would come back to get schoolwork done and be productive again. As somebody who has gone to Wanakee schools for my entire life, I understand that there are students and families in this district who are high-risk individuals and can't afford increased chances of catching the virus. This should not be a concern for bringing students back to school because it is my understanding that every family would have the choice whether to return to a hybrid model or not. The staff would also be protected through the safety protocols that are able to be put in place upon reopening. This ensures that every family is able to stay safe enough to suit their needs and protect their own health during this pandemic. All in all, online school is very stressful and draining to some students like myself and is not access acceptable to wait until mid-February to send us high schoolers to a hybrid model. Hybrid schooling would not put any high-risk individual or at increased chances of catching the virus because of the fact that everybody would have a choice whether to return to school or stay at home. I am hopeful that the decision to not return to a hybrid model until February can be reevaluated, this time with the mental health, happiness, and needs of our students in mind. Thank you all for serving on our school board and thank you for your time. Sincerely, Aaron Joe's grade 11. The next is from Dave and Angie Jost. Dear Wanakee Board of Education, we are writing this letter to request an expedited return to in-person learning format for Wanakee Community School District students. As parents of both a class of 2020 Wanakee graduate and a current high school junior, we would like to thank each and every one of you for your commitment and efforts as part of the Board of Education. We would also like to thank the district staff who have put in countless hours preparing for a very different style of learning during this unprecedented pandemic. Thank you for the return of grades K-2 earlier this year and the return of grades 3-4 starting today. We are asking that you consider returning the rest of the grades in the district, grades 5-12, through 12, to at least a hybrid version of learning by no later than December 1, 2020. Why? In-person learning has many benefits that virtual learning simply cannot provide. In-person learning takes into account the complete individual. Mental, social, and emotional health are of such importance in these children's lives. While attempts are made to balance these needs in a virtual format, it is just not the same. Additionally, Wanakee students in grades K-2 who have already returned to school appear to have a low number of COVID-19 cases. If these grades can interact with a low number of COVID cases, please give the other grades a chance as well. Waiting until the middle of February, as is the current recommended date to begin hybrid learning at the high school, 
means that these students will have been void of in-person learning for almost an entire year. Plenty of other districts in our state and around the country have successfully opened. The models are there to be followed. In a previous Board of Education meeting, both the middle school and the high school principals stated that they have a plan and are ready for a hybrid version of learning to begin at their respective schools. It appears the subjective return date timeline is the largest barrier to opening these schools to our students. If a pan plan is in place and ready to implement, why not let these students learn the way they were intended to learn? Plans are in place for hand washing, mask wearing, social distancing, etc. It is time to implement these plans, get these students back safely, and move forward to provide in-person learning opportunities for Wanakee students. In-person learning can and is occurring safely with the younger grades in our district. Wanakee can and needs to implement in-person learning as soon as possible for the rest of the students in our district as well. Thank you for your time, Dave and Angie Jost, and they give their address in Wanakee. From Grace Ramish, 8th grade, age 11, 6th grade age 11. Dear board members, I think we should go back to school because I think that it will help everyone grow more. I feel like in class we are learning really easy work right now because the teachers don't want to put hard work on us since it's virtual. Also, I think it is really hard to write out a question in email form. I really would like to go back to school so I can ask my teacher a question and not have to think about it in my email. Online school is also not very fun because I'm sitting at a chair watching my computer hours on end and I don't want to be on my electronics for that long each day. I like it when we were in the classroom because I can move around and actually communicate with my classmates and get to know them. I think that as a community, we can make this work. We could do days where we go to school and days where we won't. All I want is to go back to school. My days are boring and I would love to be able to get to know my teachers and classmates more. I think that if we go back to school, we can wear masks and we will make it safe. Plus, after we are done using our stuff, we can wipe it down with wet wipes. We can, as classmates, clean the classroom so we can stay sanitary. I really hope this letter encourages you just a little bit to make us go back to school. Sincerely, Grace Ringish. And that's the end of the public comments for tonight. And that takes us on to the item five, the budget approval and tax levy approval which is Randy and Steve. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dave. I'm going to hand it over to Steve. Um, the information that you're seeing in front of you tonight was reviewed by the Budget Committee um, last week, and Steve will be presenting it this evening to the Board for, for your consideration and approval as we move forward with setting the tax levy for this school year. So I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Thanks, Randy, and good evening, everybody. I'm sure you're ready for the 2020-2021 budget process to finally conclude and that's what we are doing this evening every year a school district's budget process is completed at the end of october when we ask the school board to approve the final version of the budget and the tax levy uh, the tax levy then has to be certified uh, by the district clerk to each of our municipalities by the deadline uh, outlined in Wisconsin state law. I do want to talk about a change that we're requesting this October from our typical process. Because we have a referendum on the ballot for November 3rd, we're asking the school board tonight to approve two versions of the budget in the tax levy and what would happen after the referendum is the school district clerk would certify the tax levy that is appropriate based on the results of the referendum. So what Rebecca has up in front of you tonight on the screen is a document that shows really at a high level the differences between the referendum being approved and not being approved and what we would be asking tonight for your consideration for approval. So at the top, what you see is if the referendum is not approved, you would see the note that says $2,127,502 remains in fund 39 for both the tax levy and an expenditure for what is called a debt service defeasance. 
a debt service defeasance is otherwise simply known as making an additional payment on the district's debt service schedule or for those familiar with like a home mortgage it's just making an extra payment that in the end ends up reducing the interest costs owed over time so at the top you will see a grand total school levy of thirty four million six hundred forty eight dollars in 262 cent, $262, excuse me. Uh, so $34,648,262. And you will see a total all, fund, all funds net expenditure budget of $72,391,100. And if Rebecca can go down and show what this looks like if the referendum is approved, the difference in this situation is that the $2,127,502 is moved from the debt service fund 39 to fund 10 for both the tax levy and the expenditure for COVID related school reopening costs. And then a debt service defeasance does not take place in 2020-2021 under this scenario. The one thing to note is that the grand total of the school property tax levy and the net expenditures remains the same under either scenario. As you know, we have provided information to the public during this referendum process that shared that the school tax levy would not change uh, as a result of a, a voter's decision to vote one way or another on the election. This document shows that information to be correct. We are asking the board to approve both versions, which would then allow us to move forward after the results of the referendum are known. You may have read in the paper this weekend, this is the exact same approach being taken by the Madison School Board as they are evaluating their budget and tax levy tonight, as they also have a referendum uh, on November 3rd. Does anyone have any questions about that concept of requesting approval of two versions of the budget and tax levy this evening before I move on to anything else? No, no I think we're okay. good, Steve. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is just point out a couple pieces of information that I think as board members would be interesting for you to see. So Rebecca, if you could go back to the documents that are included in board book, and if you can pull up the 2021 revenue limit document for a moment. Uh, what I just want to call to the board members' attention, because this is obviously a very unusual situation in really the history of the Wanakee School District, the recent history. In the revenue limit formula, which is a formula that determines the maximum amount of revenues available to a school district from the main revenue sources, we actually are considered a declining enrollment district for the 2020-2021 school year. That has not been the case in my tenure in Wanakee, which goes back to 2001. Uh, we have never been in a declining enrollment district prior to in my tenure. What you will see in line two is our previous three-year average of the student count was 4,134. And our current three-year average from the student enrollment is 4,130. That then makes our district eligible for the declining enrollment exemption, which you see in Section 10B of the Revenue Limit Formula. I just thought that was something of note that I would share with you tonight, because uh, a, a couple times a year you do see lists of declining enrollment districts and how many districts are in declining enrollment. You typically don't see a lot of Dane County suburban districts referred to as declining enrollment districts due to the increases in enrollment that have taken place in the last couple of decades. 
but this decline in our student enrollment from this September, both from the summer school perspective and the fall count, results in our district now entering into the declining enrollment exemption portion of the revenue cap formula. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is those funds that are generated in the declining enrollment exemption are removed in a subsequent year, which would be the 2021-22 year, and would only be added back in if we continue to be in the declining enrollment exemption. I just wanted to take a moment to call your attention to that. That's obviously a very unusual situation. I thought it was of note that I wanted you to be aware of. Uh, Rebecca, if you want to go back to the list of documents, please. If you can please pull up the tax levy at 2020-2021, that document, please. One of the things that I think it's always important to point out to the school board members every year is the impact of a school property tax levy change and how it varies across all of the municipalities that exist within our, our community. And in the lower right hand corner, you would see that we are proposing a 3.17% increase in the overall property tax levy in dollars. And, it, and that correlates to a 10.89% 10.89 mill rate. But if you look at the far right hand column, you can see that a 3.17% increase in property taxes affects each of our municipalities differently. So you can see the city of Middleton, which has the most significant change, has a 19.15% increase in the, in the dollar amount of, of school taxes being allocated to the city of Middleton. So why is that? That's occurring because the percentage of the value for the city of Middleton has increased from where it was the year before. You also see the same thing occurring in the town of Springfield. The town of Springfield has a 10.69% increase in the school district tax levy being allocated to that municipality. I talked about this for a couple of minutes at the budget committee meeting, but one of the most challenging aspects of a property tax levy increase is taxpayers in the various communities trying to understand why their levy varied from one year to the next. As a school district, we received the information in the TID out value column from the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. We do not receive other information. We can't explain why the town of Springfield had that type of an increase in their value. All we can explain to members of the public is what you're seeing on this spreadsheet today. We can explain the percentage to the total. We can explain the value in the town of Springfield. We can explain the percentage difference and the dollar difference. We can't explain the why. Um, that is information that is not provided to school districts. Uh, and because we work on what's called an equalized value basis, the Department of Revenue attempts to equalize the property value across our municipalities. As board members, you know the assessment or reappraisal process in municipalities varies over time and it, it does not occur on the same schedule. So that is the state's attempt to equalize the values across municipalities. I wanted you to see this this evening because as board members, you may get questions related to this topic. Uh, as an example, if you live in the town of Springfield, you will not see a 3.17% increase on your taxes. It will be larger. Uh, because there's not a lot of growth in the town of Springfield, most of what you're likely seeing here is due to a, re, uh, a, a different valuation, a reappraisal of the property. 
Uh, but it's important to understand that these changes take place every year. You can go back and look at the years prior and the town of Springfield had different information last year and the year before. So it changes annually, uh, but it's just important to understand that there's a difference between what a taxpayer is going to read in the Wanakee Tribune as far as the equalized value and the equalized mill rate compared to how that is translated down into each of our municipalities. Does anyone have any questions about that topic? If not, I'll ask Rebecca to go back to the list of documents that were in board book this evening. And I just want to explain what I included for you for your review. Uh, the first document provided uh, an overall memo that really talked through the process of the budget and tax levy and what we are requesting for approval this evening. The budget adjustment document focuses in on the changes that took place between the board approving the fourth draft of the budget in August and what we are asking the board to approve tonight. The final draft is our word version of the budget that is separated out by a counting fund. The next document includes the pages that would change if the referendum were approved. We looked at the revenue limit formula a little bit earlier. The budget adoption document is the deep PI's recommended budget adoption format. Under the tax levy, you see the document that Rebecca just pulled up. You see a referendum approved version, which changes the referendum amount between funds 10 and 39. And then you see a tax levy explanation that we post on our website, which is really designed to help explain to taxpayers some of the information I just shared on the tax levy spreadsheet. So at this point, I would open it up to any questions that board members might have on any of the documents that were included this evening. Uh, Rebecca can certainly pull them up and we can answer any questions you might have. Or as a board, when you're ready, uh, we will ask Rebecca to pull back up that high level budget and tax levy summary and request a motion to approve both versions of the budget and the tax levy. So Dave, at this point, I'll turn it back over to you to see if any board members have any questions regarding any of the documents that are included tonight. Are there any questions? I make the motion to uh, approve both documents as presented. Seconded. Um, I do have one question, Steve. I know when we talked about the budget last time, the idea that our um, balance was going down was affecting our rating. But part of the reason our balance was going down is because we weren't counting the money in our capital projects fund, I think fund, and in the maintenance. Is that going to be happening from now on so that our, our balance transfer or carryover looks better? It didn't seem like that sure. in this document. Yeah, so what Dave is referring to, uh, just a, a quick refresher, is back in May, Moody's, which is one of the bond companies that reviews the debt of the district, issued a negative outlook on the district's bond rating. Uh, that negative outlook and that report is posted on the business services page of the website if anybody wanted to refresh their memory on that. Uh, one of the main things that caused that to occur is Moody's was not considering Fund 41 or our Capital Projects Fund as a part of our debt service. One of the things that we did talk about, uh, I would say in the summer, uh, when this topic came up, was consideration at some point this school year to have the policy committee review our fund balance policy and consider including both funds 10 and 41 in our board policy's definition of a fund balance goal. 
Uh, so that's still on the table for consideration. Uh, I believe that we're going to be bringing that forward for the board to review uh, when we have an opportunity to pull the policy committee together and take a look at that request. Uh, so that's what Dave was referring to, and that is something that would be important for us to address. To address. I do want to talk about that for just a minute, though, Dave. Uh, the Wanaki Tribune asked me uh, for an article this week, what were some of the long-term implications if the referendum were to pass or not pass? One of the things to keep in mind is that if the referendum does not pass, the COVID-related school expenditures do not go away. And we are going to have to pull the budget committee together very quickly to review the strategies that are available to us to look at these COVID-related expenditures. One of them is the district fund balance, uh, which would result in a further reduction in the fund balance, which would very likely result in Moody's looking at our next evaluation and continuing forward with the next step of a negative outlook, which is actually downgrading a district's bond rating. Uh, so there are long-term implications to both scenarios, either the referendum passing or not passing, and it really will be critical that the budget committee has an opportunity to get back together as a committee once we know the results of the referendum so we can begin planning accordingly. So thank you, Dave, for that question. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion to adopt the vote, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? And that concludes that part, actually A and B of the agenda, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so we have a consideration of future meetings. There was a request for a motion for a special meeting. Did someone want to make that motion? No, I would uh, give uh, the direction to uh, staff uh, and administration to bring back a plan at our, our November 9th meeting to uh, bring all students back to uh, school by the uh, semester. All students. All students. Good candidate. Yeah, you're talking hybrid. Not you're not talking. Yeah. Yes, that, that, that yeah, that, that's what Jack means. You mean getting all students back in their hybrid by the semester? That's to bring a plan to accomplish that, not to say that that's exactly what would happen depending on the situation. To bring that plan. You're saying a plan. Uh, You'd like to see a timeline of how that could move forward. Is what I think. Okay. Uh, and I would. Uh, is do you want to make that as a motion or is that is there a second can i amend it if i second it you can amend it after you second okay yes. i'll second it. okay would you like to make an amendment yeah i'd like to amend it um i think the timing of us doing this meeting is actually important i don't like having these meetings where we're doing it immediately after the uh, glidot committee is meeting and i think it would be prudent if we give the committee some direction before they go into the meeting on the 9th. So I would amend the motion to the meet on November 2nd. It's important to be doing this before an election too. And if we're going to want people to go into the polls on the 3rd and listen to what we're saying here, then I think we need to be moving with all due haste. And trust me, I don't want to have another meeting next Monday either, but I think it's important for the community to do it as fast as possible. Is there a second for the amendment? So the amendment is to move that meeting up to next Monday is to have the request of the administration be presented at a meeting on November 2nd so, so what I understand what Jack is just to kind of follow the track of it so everybody can follow it Jack is recommending and his motion was to for us to have a plan for how we would bring back the different segments of grades up through grade 12 by the semester and Mike's motion then was and was to move that meeting from the ninth to next week that's my understanding we, we can do that is there a second for the amendment 
second the amendment. Okay, so we're discussing just the amendment, which is creating a meeting on November 2nd to work on Jack's motion. But this all we're talking, we're not saying yes or no to the motion of Jack's, we're just changing the date from doing November 9th to November 2nd. I want to make sure that we get a good, good outline and so forth. And I think that doing it by the 9th is going to give you the opportunity to uh, get busing and all of that kind of stuff under control. You know, what we've been doing since uh, March is we've been coming here every week, and I don't think we give the administration enough time to really put together the plan that, uh, that we can go to, uh, go ahead, Mark. With all due respect, the details with busing is contingent upon getting a survey out to the parents. It's going to take more than two weeks to put that together. So if you want to plan without that specificity of details, I, I think it's probably doable. But if, you're, if you want the comprehensive plan, neither one of those states is reasonable because we're going to have to survey the parents, as we have done for other schools, find out how many students families would take uh, avail themselves to it. We certainly would have to educate them as to what that model is going to look like and we had a presentation two weeks ago that gave a view of it. But that has to be out. Once that comes in, now you're going to have to look at the busing routes. So if you want the comprehensiveness of it, neither of those states make sense. Yeah. If, so if I can just add something, Mike, I think what and help me, Jack, if I'm missing what you're looking for. What you're looking for is you're looking for the plan to come forward that's going to show how we're going to progress. Today we started third and fourth grade back. How are we going to get from fifth grade through twelfth grade back timeline-wise? Part of that timeline is going to include some of those. I don't think all of those have to be done by the ninth where you have all the bus routes filled but you have to have the plan in place for when you're going to have those done for different grade level spans to get them back by the start of the semester. That we can do. And what we're doing is laying out the process of what that will look like and then start to chunk those together if we can do them together or if we, and there's gonna be shifts with potential start and end times, some of those aspects. Those pieces can be brought together. I would see it as if we do meet next week, I think there's probably two aspects to this. It's certainly a being able to lay that out for you, and we can revisit that again on the 9th with any additional information that we have. But as far as having like, I think we can lay out the plans of the timelines to do all of that and show what that would look like for the board. And I think to your point, Mike, that if that was something that could be presented to the medical ad hoc committee, as a discussion point as far as what are the proponents that would bring to make that feasible or not. Is that generally kind of yeah. what I'm hearing from you? Brian? So, and I know we've had this discussion before, that people change their mind. Any value into surveying everybody now? Yeah, there's value in it. The one piece- And then piece, also on the HR side, yeah. say your grades are coming under discussion, make it as, you know, are we, sure. who's moving forward, who's not? Right. I, I think there's a couple things. As far as the shift from 712 is different than the K6, because you're not having to shift teachers, because it's the virtual and the in-person is the same section. So that makes it a little, you still have to know who's in and who's out, and you've got to create the, the Monday, Tuesday cohort and the Thursday, Friday. I believe, I'm looking at Annie back here because I know you were part of some of those discussions, our fifth and sixth grade already have some of those pieces kind of laid out when they did their scheduling at the onset anticipating that they'd be back early. So I think some of that's what we do have to get where our parents' choices and how does that make a shift. So that's absolutely a piece that we would have to do and that's part of what we would provide when we present that to the board is when would all of those markers in a timeline piece have to take place? When would we get them moving? And what's our turnaround? But the pieces that we also have to do, and it's pieces Brian's working on with, there's HR components to this. 
of which we would have to address. I mean, I think he and I have talked about, do we need to bring an HR committee together to look at some things? I, I think from our perspective, it would probably be, if we can put the whole package together of what we're thinking about and bring that all together at once. I think that's the most streamlined approach to it. If the HR committee would like to meet before we bring this whole thing, we're happy to pull that together as well. But there are some pieces that we have to talk about just with regards to um, some of the remote and in-person aspects and some of the leave pieces that are coming to an end um, per some of the federal leave options. So there's some, some nuances that we have to work out there. Substitute teacher piece is, is continuing to be a challenge and we have some ideas of how to help improve that. I was glad to hear that there are some parents looking at how they can help in with that. I think we had 20 subs today just within, the, um, within our district. So I mean, those are some things that we have to keep our mind on and see as we bring more kids back how we fill some of those pieces. How many of those were filled? Other than having to use administrators to fill yeah. them. Brian, was all but one filled today? 20 out of 21 Right. And I think the one that wasn't filled was a, was a care of position, is that right? So we were able to work. In that plan, can we also get an idea of, I'm assuming that eliminates enhanced learning, but I would like to know how that affects students with IEPs and special ed and have that separated as well as how many of those will not feel comfortable coming to school anymore if we change models? Yep. Just for, have that information. No, that's a good piece. That, 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 thank you, Brian, for that. Mark? So that stuff that you put at your plate. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, would, I would strongly suggest that because yeah. they're going to be coming in a week from now and then another week uh, if it, it doesn't make sense. Right. Mark? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that we also, one, need to keep an open mind. I, I, I'm not certain that going to the proposed hybrid precludes bringing kids back into a enhanced situation for those teachers who may want to do that, despite when the kids come in in the morning, if they have lab class. I mean, I, I would hope flexibility and creativity isn't excluded because we're saying this is our model. I think we have to keep those doors open. It may never happen, but I think we need possibilities need to be uh, available. Um, we did hear earlier that we have 19, um, I don't know if it's just custodial positions, but support positions that weren't filled up to you know, some time ago. Um, and there have been some insinuation at least, I, I don't know if it was stronger than that, that we may need to look at outsourcing for the cleaning. And so I would I, I, I think, think we well, would have yeah. a sense of those needs as well. What are the operational needs to make this happen? And you know, that's one of the things I've cautioned people who have written to us, that we are moving forward, but we were, it's, it's a bit slower because we're trying to handle the operational needs. Absolutely. And so, and I know that's yeah, And the cleaning part. piece is a whole topic that I will, we yeah. can bring into some of these pieces that we've been investigating and looking at anywhere from a, a sourcing op option as far as how you actually do the work, who does it, what you can or can't, I mean, you, you heard students talk about helping out with, the, what those, with some of those between, how does that all fit? Those so are some pieces. We'd be better off having the medical advisory committee meet after the ninth, because quite frankly, there's only two weeks between when we've opened with our third and fourth and that meeting. If we push them back a week and then we met right after them, that might be even a smarter move. Well, right now, the first question under consideration is if the meeting is approved, if this discussion piece is approved, should it be on the second or ninth? That's all we're voting on first. Well, like, the only thing I'll add is by board policy, any board member can request in writing that a special meeting be set, and that's not up for debate anyway. So I just put that out there. The reason I want it to be on the second is so that we can be 
as aggressive as possible to answer questions and to get information out there. And we may not do anything on the second, but for say to the medical committee, this is what you we want you to give us some advice on. Um, but I think that'll give the community the impression that we're taking these needs seriously, even if we don't necessarily agree with them. So that's the only reason I moved to amend to the second. So Other well, comments on second to the ninth? Would it be helpful to have two weeks versus one week to do this, given all that science? No, I, I think there's two parts. The, the, I mean, Jack's point is, is spot on. There's a lot to this. Just to make, if you want to get the comprehensive view of what all of these are to hit those deadlines, yeah, I, I would like to the ninth. Is there benefit to do what Mike is saying and give you what we have next week? So if there's other questions that are coming, I can tell you what, what we'll be pulling together. I mean, there's merit to both. I mean, I just don't want to keep, the piece I want to, I want to get away from is right now we have so much uncertainty. You guys are coming back through meetings every week. You're getting public comments and, and uprest within our community. It's the same with my team and it's the same with my teaching staff. Right now what we need to do, and I think it's part of it, is look at our plan, look at our, put some dates to these things. Jack put out a target of getting everybody back by the, by the semester. Let us take a look at it. Let's vet it out through the medical advisory committee. I mean, one of the things that we're learning is you're seeing getting a little bit off topic, but you're seeing the, the numbers from our census track. We can feel when the numbers rise because they've been high this last week. Our team has worked diligently for the last week with a lot of contact tracing and a lot of pieces that have been going on. And because of the work that's been happening, we've been able to manage it. What does that look like as we bring back more kids? I don't know. I think third and fourth grade is going to go really well. I anticipate we'll continue to do this with the processes we have. So that being said, the number, as far as the census track numbers, probably, I don't know if I can give you a green light, red light that says you go or stop. It's a number that you're going to know it when you hit it based on what we're able to do internally. So that's the piece of the plan that we just have to keep in mind. But to Jack's point, as far as getting a, a, a piece that we can lay out there as a timeline to try to hit, and for us to then try to line up all of our resources to make it happen, that makes sense to me. Because we've got to get out of the cycle of continually having all this unrest. And that's for everybody. That's community, that's board, that's administration, and that's teaching staff. So if that's what we can get to and that's what's going to help us to, I'm, I'm happy to meet next week to start to pull these pieces together if that helps to bring some pictures to it and then we can finalize some thoughts and get the medical advisories um, thought process around it. Either one of those approaches makes sense. But I, I can do either one. I, it's I'm going to say that I feel better about the second for one reason. I don't want an eight-hour meeting. I think that's exhausting. I think the presentation starts heading everywhere. The questions are endless, and the public can't understand it, and I think we as board members start to really lose focus. I'd rather have two smaller meetings and get a decision after the second or third meeting than have one massive meeting that's going until 2 a.m. I mean, the ninth is our regular board meeting. It won't be just this issue. And there are some other things we have to do on the ninth, so from that respect, to break it up into two to make it a little more manageable does make some sense. So. We're still on just deciding will this, if this motion passes, will it happen on the 2nd or the 9th? That's all we're deciding right now. All those in favor of the amendment to make it the 2nd, say there, aye. Oh, I'm more, sorry. You have more comment? Uh, uh, is there any more? This is just done the 2nd or the 9th. Well, I, I just, I'm not, I, I think having a decision on a plan for the rest of the semester is ridiculous for the 2nd. I just but think it's not enough time. I don't think um, it's a request, but I think you're overlooked. It's the motion is to give us a, a timetable. It's not the motion is not to say that either on the second or the ninth we're going to make a final decision. That's not no, what the no. motion requires. I want them to have all. a time to make a plan, in which we have a plan, but <laughs> you know this stuff does not take one week to do. No. It, it, that's why we have a plan that has a, been extended 
and pencils in February because it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and I just think, you know, um, before people vote on the third, like, I mean, geez, the three closed cards, the, I don't know how the online meeting went, what the coach teaching, but it, people have the information. Right? Oh, They're ready to vote one way or the other, but I, I think for the plan needs to be in place, two, they need to lead to. If the purpose is to get the medical committee this information, and where we're kind of where we're embracing it about, I think we could go the ninth and then ask the medical committee not to meet on the ninth, but the next week. And well, all they're doing is providing us information of feel. They're not going to yep. tell us to do no. this, to incorporate this. Yep. They're just giving us the information that they're seeing and feeling as an individual physician or nurse practitioner in the area. So we can't, if we ask them to make an action, they're not going to do that. And that's when we say in our statement that they are here to provide information to us but not, and not make decisions uh, for us. So, and they're not going to I've had conversations after me, but not happening. So, and, and I think they've uh, reviewed, you know, all of our process. Uh, they, they've reviewed everything that we've done, uh, and I, I think coming out of that committee, sitting on the committee, it appears that they're, you know, they, they think that a plan is a good plan. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not going to eliminate the risk, but we can mitigate uh, the risk. And I think that's what we're going to hear again. You know, we've got the contact tracers. Uh, you know, you're going to bring in the information. Your contact tracers are, are <coughs> what I just heard, are doing a good job. Uh, you know, working uh, working the system. Um, we may need another one or two. You know, as we bring more people back. But I think uh, in what we're doing today, and we bring the uh, three four back, we bring the five six back. Now we're starting to get some volumes to say, do we have enough people? Uh, and putting us in a position where we can be successful uh, going after the uh, second day. And again, they're the ones that sort of like you feel, community spread, it shows up in what we're dealing with the district. They feel in our community and around the state as practitioners in hospitals and clinics. So I think that's right now, that's the most benefit that I'm getting from them, is what's your feel? This week or two weeks. Right. When you see coming down, that's what we want to get, to be able to make a decision or be prepared for what may yeah. be coming. There's also just as a side here that kind of relates, but we do feel the impacts of community spread. We do feel when those tra census tract pieces go up. We are sending out a message to all parents tomorrow telling them we need their help. We need their help with contact tracing because it's not coming at a quick rate out of public health and public health is now in a crisis mode. So you, you, we have to have people reporting to us that when our contact tracers contact them, we need honest answers. We need to help find out where people are at. Not because we want to get anybody in trouble or do anything, we're not pointing fingers, we just want help making sure we get to the right people so we can keep everything moving forward. And we've got to remind folks that we all, as a community, are in this together as we want to walk through these things. And that's just watching what our behaviors are and being diligent about it. So there's a message that's already scripted that we're sending out tomorrow, and that's based off of our experience from last Tuesday through Sunday. There's been a lot going on. Um, so that's part of it, and then it's kind of putting these plans together, and all of that has to meld together to make it happen. But. Okay, uh, so basically our first vote here is just deciding if the motion passes in the second vote, would it happen on the second or the ninth? So if you vote I, if you vote yes, you are voting to have it on the second. All those in favor of the second, say aye. Aye. All those in favor of the ninth, of not having it on the second, but having it on the ninth, say no. 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 So the motion, the amendment fails. We're back to the main motion, which is that on the 9th, the administration present the information as stated in the motion, which do you have that, Rebecca? Um, 
roughly, I have okay. that um, staff and administration bring a plan to the 11-9th meeting uh, to bring all students back in a hybrid model by the semester. Is that clear? And again, they're going to bring a plan. It doesn't mean that that plan has to be voted on that night. They're just going to bring a plan. You're going to see it. You can set up questions, whatever you want. Any discussion on that motion? I just think it's smart to bring it back to one solid plan you can in two weeks, get it to them, and great. All, all those in favor of the plan, say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed to the motion, say no. And the motion passes. So that will be on the ninth. Um, so, uh, can I just ask a few questions just so that we're, while we're on this topic and this is fresh in our minds, I mean, I have a number of the questions that people have asked about the cleaning, the IEP, some of the enhanced remote. Um, obviously, we need a timeline, busing. Some of those are going to be timeline based as far as what our process is. Are there other things that are on board members' minds that you want to make sure that we're including? You know, I'm going to include the HR piece from the subs, um, contact tracing, kind of what we're seeing. We'll, we'll include uh, updates on all of those pieces. Anything else board members want to see as we're starting to formulate some of those pieces? Randy, has the HVAC system been done on the other three? Yes, the HVAC system, the ionization system is installed in all buildings. It's all done. Okay. I would assume that part of that is going to be when you guys send out the survey Serving and I would assume so that parents have a feel for what they're coming and they should be able to make Yeah, and I would like the public to know that they need to think about this this week. <laughs> and you start thinking, yeah. what am I going to do from the end of the semester or when my kid gets called in? I I don't think they can wait any too much farther for us to move forward. So. No, I mean there is a point here where I've got to do the, all of those pieces. Yeah, we can. We'll, we'll, what we'll be doing is we'll be talking as a team to kind of put those pieces together, so we have consensus on our end of how to do that. Any of the pieces that we can do on a proactive end, we'll also get those rolling. I guess the other thing that, uh, as you're talking to your administrative team, you know, I would uh, I would say plan for 50 percent and 75 percent. Mm -hmm. Have yeah. you know, uh, you know, so that at least we're thinking about that. Yeah. What do you mean 50 Yeah, and, and at the, the percentage of kids coming back. Yeah. And at the secondary level, it has less of an impact than at the fifth and sixth because the teacher right. is the same. It's more of a, that's more of a transportation piece, but that's just a matter of number of buses, etc. So, but yeah, right. we'll, we'll talk through that piece. If you're thinking about it, you know, at least uh, have those, your staff uh, should have those numbers in mind. Yeah. Were there other meetings you needed to consider? I don't think so. I'm just going to include everything that we have within that report. And some of this will just be recommendations of things that we need in order to make it successful. Um, I guess the other thing that I'd like to uh, bring up for the uh, special meetings, uh, we're going into our next budget year. Uh, you know, we've just concluded one. We're going into uh, the next budget year, uh, starting to plan. I think it's important that we have a retreat to sit down and understand what the, uh, what the priorities are for the board, you know, as we start thinking about the next public. And I think if we could uh, do that, I would uh, probably submit uh, probably December or early January. I, I would totally agree, and I know we've talked about having a retreat. The problem is we have been having board meetings every single week and in talking with various members at different times. It just didn't seem like there was time to do that. So let's hope we can not have these important. Meetings. I, I really think it's important uh, to have to talk through these things because I think out of that gives direction to uh, goals and directions to uh, the administration. I'll put on that I'm, I'll work on it the next week or two and try and find a spot and a way we can do it. One, you have to remember, it still has to be a public meeting. 
Um, and two, we've got to find a way to do it given our restrictions. But I'll do that with the idea of probably looking at the first or second week of December is probably the fastest we could do something like that if you want to do it before the end of the year, if that makes sense. Okay. I would suggest the December or January. January, I will be probably not coming to anything face to face. Okay. December would be better. Um, other meetings, I would like, we don't have to schedule it now, but next, on January 9th, we need to set up a meeting for the policy committee. I'm going to go start looking at that reserve thing, and I'll work with Steve about it, with the idea of getting that done so we don't get into our next review and get another negative rating, oh, yeah, just because we have millions of dollars in the wrong spot. Yep. Nope, that's not a problem. I think Steve's already got some draft language to be able to do that. Um, is there anything else? Does Steve need a budget meeting right after the election? Yeah, Steve, do you need anything right after the referendum? Thanks for bringing that up, Rebecca. I do think we can wait until the 9th to schedule a meeting, but I would like to request the budget committee meet sometime in November after the 9th but before Thanksgiving, if that would work. So why don't we just schedule that now? So the budget committee sometime after the 9th but before the... Before the 24th, yes. So that's Mark Jack Killen, right? Yep. And Randy, if you're willing to schedule it now, we could also look at like the 4th or the 5th when we have the rock random results. Anytime, you know, the. Yeah. Uh, any, just any time in November, just making sure we get a chance to regroup after we know what the results are and can begin planning accordingly. Yep. So we can do the 4th or the 5th, or we can do something after the 9th, but before the 24th. So. Are they going to have to do the results? Um, will, will you have the results? Um, We're not doing the canvas till the... The, um, tenth. Tenth. tenth is the canvas. So we'll have, we'll have the tentative have the results before the. Right. Unofficial results. right. How soon do you get the unofficial results? It depends on how fast I can get the clerks to give them to me, and it might not be until the tenth. Yeah, it's <laughs> possible. I, I would suggest that we do it at the night. You have to board the. Okay. Well, well, so why don't we? Oh, we're not going to do it the evening of the night. You can say after the night, but not on the night. Are you crazy? I'm sorry, Mark. It almost gave me a heart attack. All right. So why don't we look for a date after the night? Steve, is there a good date in there for you? And do you three can you meet like early in the morning? Sure. Steve, are you okay with it early in the morning? So, Randy, the 10th, 11th, and 12th would not be good. All right. Okay. The 9th, the 13th, or any time the week of the 16th would work. Yeah, how about, a, was there a date in this? How about the 17th? Totally open except the cabinet meeting. Oh, that's uh, true. How about the, well, we've got, we've got meetings, all of us. Um, well, these guys could do the afternoon, too. Yeah, they can do it in the morning, and Steve can do that. So what about the week of the 16th? Is there a oh, date the for 16th, our committee members 16th. that are better? 16th is totally open. Let's take it. How long are you looking, Steve? An hour or more? I would say an hour. Hour max. What works best in the day for you, Steve? Uh, Any time on the 16th is fine. Early, late. You want to do it right away in the morning? I think I that's at 4.30, Steve, so uh, maybe 5? 7.30, 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock. Okay, I'm ready. 8 o'clock. How about 8 o'clock on the 16th? Can you do the morning? Can you do the morning, John? Sure. 8 o'clock, can you do the morning? Okay. All right. Thank you. And did we need an HR meeting or no? No. We, we do, we do, you, oh, you do want one, Brian? We get an HR meeting in before the, the uh, uh, 9th, uh, just 
about some uh, budget budget connected topics, negotiation related oh, items. All right. Who is who is budget or who is HR? Uh, Judy, Joe, and Brian. Got it. There a date you'd like to do that? Um. Well, uh, and I would say that, that same week of, of the election, we could go late in the week. Um, it would be great to have unofficial results, but our topics could go forward even without the results of the referendum. We could have some discussions related to the different items. So I would say if we Fourth or fifth? on Friday, I mean, I mean if, it, if during the day works, I, I could make any time work during Friday. November 5th? Yeah. Open for me? Yeah, it's open for me. It's open. Pick a time, Brian. Uh, 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock? What would work better first of all? 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock on the 6th for HR. To a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Right, thanks, everybody. I didn't hear what he said about the server. I, just, I heard you say it. You could see it. Well, just put a date on it. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Yeah. I'm stopping this now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I the the hey, Steve, could you, s if you have a draft policy for that, could you send it to me? Or have you, have you gotten that far? Oh, I'd love to see it then. Thanks.